Hello, I'm Summer Starr. I am an associate professor in the English department at San Francisco State University and an affiliated faculty member with the Dickens Universe at UC Santa Cruz. I'm happy to be making my contribution to this series and just want to thank John Jordan, Renee Fox, Courtney Mahaney, and of course all of the friends of the Dickens Universe for helping to keep us together and to keep this program going even in times like this. So today I want to share one of my favorite passages to go from one of my favorite Dickens novels, if not my very favorite, Great Expectations. There is a lot to love about Great Expectations. There is a lot to hate about Great Expectations. <laughs> But the thing that draws me back to this book as a human and as an academic is the way that Dickens makes moral experience and moral feeling in this novel so material and so bodily in its recognition. You can think of the way that Pip's sense of class shame and self-loathing are just concretized in his thick boots and his obsession with the idea of his thick boots. You can think of the unexpected sharing of the coach ride he has with the go-between convict when he feels that breath on the back of his neck like a pungent searching odor. You can think of the greasy shoulder stains on the wall of Jagger's office and how that just tells you everything you need to know about the moral relationship Jaggers has had with his clients for many years. These details and so many others just speak to the way in this, how in this novel, moral consciousness lives in the way objects talk to us, um, sometimes to our nerve endings and our stomachs, even before we are fully aware of it. To me, this is what makes the first chapters of Great Expectations so captivating because we live through the experience of a child and a child undergoing his first moral crisis. And I think for many people, the first moral crisis of childhood has to do with hiding something, um, very often something edible. Pip's sense of fidelity and his very sense of identity becomes split between the convict who accosts him in the churchyard and his beloved stepfather, best only friend, Joe the Blacksmith. So John Jordan has already reflected on the great scene of Pip's absconding with the goods from the Christmas larder um, as he goes out into the marshes at night. My passage is a prequel to this and it stands out to me for the way in which Dickens comes up with such a brilliant, unusual, humorous metaphor for moral discomfort and the nature of conscience itself. A slice of buttered bread down the leg of one's pants. <laughs> so before this, we get the great description of Mrs. Joe in her sadistic apothecary way, buttering the loaf against her pin infested apron before hewing it in half and offering slices to Joe and Pip. And uh, Pip, of course, comes up with the re resolution that he has to save this slice um, and comes up with the resolution to put the hunk of bread and butter down his trousers Here's what happens. The effort of resolution necessary to the achievement of this purpose I found to be quite awful. It was as if I had to make up my mind to leap from the top of a high house or plunge into a great depth of water. And it was made the more difficult by the unconscious Joe. In our already mentioned Freemasonry as fellow sufferers, and in his good-natured companionship with me, it was our evening habit to compare the way we bit through our slices by silently holding them up to each other's admiration now and then, which stimulated us to new exertions. Tonight, 
Joe several times invited me by the display of his fast diminishing slice to enter upon our usual friendly competition. But he found me each time with my yellow mug of tea on one knee and my untouched bread and butter on the other. At last, I desperately considered that the thing I contemplated must be done and that it had best be done in the least improbable manner consistent with the circumstances. I took advantage of a moment when Joe had just looked at me and got the bread and butter down my leg. Joe was evidently made uncomfortable by what he supposed to be my loss of appetite and took a thoughtful bite of his slice, which he didn't seem to enjoy. He turned it about in his mouth much longer than usual, pondering over it a good deal, and after it all gulped it down like a pill. He was about to take another bite and had just got his head on one side for a good purchase on it when his eye fell on me and he saw that my bread and butter was gone. The wonder and consternation with which Joe stopped on the threshold of his bite and stared at me were too evident to escape my sister's observation. And what follows are many threats of tar water, <laughs> great upheaval in the kitchen, and then this great conclusion. Conscience is a dreadful thing when it accuses man or boy, but when, in the case of a boy, that secret burden cooperates with another secret burden down the leg of his trousers, it is, as I can testify, a great punishment. The guilty knowledge that I was going to rob Mrs. Joe, I never thought I was going to rob Joe, for I never thought of any of the housekeeping property as his, united to the necessity of always keeping one hand on my bread and butter as I sat, or when I was ordered about the kitchen on any small errand, almost drove me out of my mind. It was Christmas Eve, and I had to stir the pudding for next day with a copper stick from seven to eight by the Dutch clock. I tried it with the load upon my leg, and that made me think afresh of the man with the load on his leg and found the tendency of exercise to bring the bread and butter out in my ankle quite unmanageable. Happily, I slipped away and deposited that part of my conscience in my garret bedroom. Now, Dickens is not always light-handed in his moralizing, least of all in Great Expectations, but what's remarkable here is how Pip's betrayal of Joe, a wrong and a theme that will ride him through the novel, begins with such a slight thing. Not simply hiding the bread from his friend, but not participating in the game of comparing bitten slices that belongs to his innocent gamish boyhood. And yet, the passage gets at the way more deeply in which having a conscience from the beginning involves a realization of a secret self. The words root meaning literally being with a private knowledge. With his usual humor and aptness, it's as though Dickens is giving us an object and very everyday definition of conscience and taking us back to those unlooked for moments when that sense of a private knowledge of the self begins. Moral consciousness, as we learn in this novel, breeds in a highly imaginative mind. And this passage, along with all of the child chapters of the novel, tell us this. It is what makes guilt work. What can make dead rabbits hanging in the larder seem to wink at one in complicity? or cows in the marsh seem to say, hello, young thief, as Pip takes the food to the convict. In this passage, though, it's the combination of a sudden boyish, so familiar gesture combined with the weight of moral meaning of betrayal that's so Dickensian to me and important for the way it binds us as readers to Pip so early in the book. We have to imagine how he gets the piece of bread and butter down his pants. We have to imagine how he keeps it stuck to his leg while stirring the Christmas pudding for an hour. We have to imagine the feeling 
of it all inside and out. In a way incomparably odd, Dickens takes us off guard with how close we are imaginatively brought to his characters as readers. So thank you all for listening. Please stay well and safe. Please remember on which side your bread is buttered. And I hope that we will all reconvene in Santa Cruz very soon. Thank you.